Welcome back to The Debrief, the YouTube podcast where we break down everything that happened at the IFSC World Cups and World Championships. And of course, we're coming to you to discuss uh, the lead World Cup that happened in Briançon last weekend. Joining me this week, as always, is John Bergman, who writes for Climbing Magazine, Climbing Business Journal, and is also the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And our most frequent recurring guest is Eddie Falk, joining us from some snowy land in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, hiding away in a cabin he's working on a book too now he he hasn't had to spend all this time writing quite as many words as john has because eddie's got an archive of uh, photographs and uh, that book you can look forward to coming out sometime soon is on the circuit a photographic journey through competition climbing from 2015 to 2020 effectively i don't know i'm looking forward to being the uh, kind of a, 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 a summary of the pre-Olympic era, the build up to the Olympics. Uh, and from what I've seen so far, it's a, it's a book of excellent photographs, uh, essays, reflections, and commentary. Um, Eddie, how's the progress on the book? Yeah, it's really good. Uh, so I got stalled for a while because I had my leg operation. And after mm. that, the painkillers really did affect the quality of my work for a while. Uh, so I had to step back because I looked back at it and I was actually a bit embarrassed. Um, I hope you saved that copy though. I want, I want the, I want the tipsy draft. That's the, the bonus, right? Yeah. That, that'll be the subscriber only bonus yeah. version. Um, and then, yeah, it was a bit of a rough period for me. So I didn't stay involved with it as much and engage with it as much, even though I'd hit that 90% point, I just needed to give my head a break. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think realistically I'm a week away from finishing um, and the goal is to have it published and available for people to order and have, you know, in their presence on Christmas. Very excited. Very excited. We'll have you back. We'll do a we'll do a walkthrough of the book, uh, which I think I we'll, promised... do a, we'll do a release. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do a, we'll do a live release party here. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, as the way the show always goes, we cover the headlines from the most recent competition, as well as our big winners and our biggest losers. And uh, in, in tradition, we always have our guests go first. So, Eddie, uh, what is your headline from Brianson 2022? Um, my headline, and it's probably the one that's annoying the heck out of everyone by now, because it's funny, every time you watch commentary or listen to anyone or read anyone on Instagram, they all say the same thing, and it's Jesse Grouper won. <laughs> and he is, everyone says, so happy he won, he is the world's nicest person. Mm -hmm. And it's just true. There's a reason we all say that. He is just a breath of fresh air. He doesn't have a bad thing to say about anyone always enthusiastic, absolute crusher. And I've known Jesse for a long time. I first met him in Youth Worlds in Arco in 2015, and he came second that year, just unluckily for him on Countback, um, but climbed amazingly. And then there was some interesting scoring in semis, which meant that he didn't win that. But he's always been one to watch. He's always been there. And just seeing him progress in the sport and as an adult has been amazing like seeing him grow up from this kid i first met in arco to this college educated lovely guy who's also a world cup winner just i was devastated i wasn't there to shoot it because that one would have meant a lot like yeah he's what you know a few years ago, we were in Red Rocks climbing and we had no accommodation and we're driving around trying to find accommodation and it's Jesse, Sean Bailey, myself, um, Jordan and Zoe um, Leibovich and we're trying to find a cheap hotel and there's a conference on. We can't find a hotel and it's Jesse's birthday and his dad sent me money to buy Jesse a cake. <laughs> and everyone's flustered and Jesse's just sitting there with this huge grin because he's just having the best day ever and that sort of sums up Jesse like nothing gets him down even though everyone else is like oh where are we going to stay what are we going to do oh this is Jesse's birthday and we haven't got it together it's a disaster and Jesse's just sitting there like this is great I'm with my friends I'm really enjoying this and it's that positive outlook like you know I put in my Instagram post nice guys finish first and that's such a rarity normally it's the old nice guys finish last adage so yeah my highlight totally jesse group are just so so wrapped for him 
You talk about just a great season after after you know supposedly taking a bit of a break for for COVID in school, like just a huge ramp up from from third to second to first over four events. Um, I at the end of this, all I was thinking was our end of year awards. The breakout of the year category is going to be impossible. There's already like five <laughs> candidates that you could argue for for people that have just had stunner 2022s. Um, really, you, you've only got five. Oh, man. Like, like I'm trying <laughs> trying to narrow it down. I've got five. Like you could only nominate I, I four. Think pro- I think I've probably got nearly that in speed climbing alone. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's been a, an insane year i think in, in part because it's the first real post covid year so we are seeing much more of a global mix um and we're seeing so for instance and it's one thing that frustrates me massively is matt goes oh, i don't know this person i don't know that person but if you look at ifsc results in 2019 you could see jesse progressing and jesse coming seventh in finals fifth in finals starting to ramp up and then COVID happened and he disappeared Mm -hmm. well it's not that he disappeared everything disappeared yeah and and then when it when it came back he he went from being seventh or fifth to being third second first and so it's to me there's like quite a long slope there and it's great to see and yeah i like i'm stoked for him i'm really fascinated by the season as a whole with so much enthused young talent coming through it does really feel like a changing of the guard Mm -hmm. yeah john what uh what do you have to reflect on about uh jesse grouper this year yeah i think of jesse's win here as it was kind of like a reward to those of us fans us three and then everybody in the discord and then a lot of the the kind of diehard real like competition insiders because Jesse has been on the circuit for a long time, you know, not consistently, like you said, Eddie, but he's, he's been around for a while. If people have been, like I said, insiders and really paid attention to the results beyond just the podium, beyond just the finals. Like if you really dug into the kind of down in the, into the depths of the years past, you would have seen Jesse there. And, you know, at, coming from the U.S., he's a two-time national champion uh, in lead. He pr- probably would have been a three-time champion, except for the 2020 season got wrecked because of the pandemic. But I think he won, if I remember correctly, in 2019 and, two, and, and 2021. And in 2020, there wasn't a national championship. And then this year, he gets bronze in Innsbruck. He gets a silver in Villar. And on top of that, like Eddie said, there was this... <laughs> He, it seems like he he was just everywhere. Like a week before his win, serendipitously, the IFSC runs this interview with him uh, by uh, Richard Asplund was the guy who wrote the article, and it appears on the IFSC website. Just so happens it's the week right before Jesse wins the gold medal, and the IFSC also had started to do kind of some interviews with Jesse on camera and everything. So it just felt like there was this magical buzz that was building for this really to be Jesse's moment at Briançon. Uh, it was great stuff. That what's interesting to me, amid all this, is it does feel like Jesse is kind of this fresh phenom, sort of a new face to the to the podium. When in fact, he's the same age as Nathaniel Coleman. He's a year younger than Sean Bailey. He's kind of there. It's he is that generation. He's not like the seventeen year old, eighteen year old generation. Yet, just because, like you said, he took off some took some time off and everything, this just kind of seems to be his 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 moment of peaking a little bit, maybe a little later than we would have thought otherwise. Like you know, usually if if people are going to peak by the time they're twenty five or whatever, we've kind of seen that beforehand. Uh, maybe when they're twenty one, twenty two, we haven't really seen that from Jesse yet on the international stage. But I think the pandemic had something to do with that. So we see it here. Better late than never. Awesome stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can start talking about countries with big depths of field, and uh, and the United States is certainly one of them. Um, yeah, and I think um, just going in there, you know, the states for the longest time, and it's changing now, has had a go to college philosophy. Um, so you've seen this break in a lot of American climbers' careers where they've been talented juniors, and then they they sort of finish at college age almost like it's a junior sport for them and not a whole lot 
come back post college, and Jesse's one that did. And I think you know if he hadn't, then maybe he'd be up there for longer. And it's interesting because he's 25, and as you said, John, that feels a bit older. But guys, especially I think in the lead, with a couple of exceptions, you tend to find the talent come through a bit later. Girls, it seems to be younger. But guys, it does still seem to be that with with a few exceptions, you're into your 20s before you really hit the ground running. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it is, it is you find not necessarily peaking but but kind of showing up at the very top is kind of more towards the 23 25 for for men um uh, at least over the last like 10 years um yeah you don't get too many of those super young phenoms um eddie what's uh or pardon me john what's uh what's your uh, headline from uh, from brian son yeah my headline is that yanya garnbrett returns to the lead circuit even though she never left and here here's what i mean about that Chamonix was very weird, right? And we know that Yanya, from her social media posts and stuff, was not too pleased with how it played out, all of the tops. Despite that, though, and Tyler, you and I addressed this on the previous episode, I think Chamonix was actually a really big win for Yanya and a really important win. I think it's one of her greatest wins because it showed her tenacity in a different way how many three tops before her and she kind of she had to come out and top it and stuff i thought that was great but that being said i understand why yanya you know said what she said about it and all those points are completely valid i think we can all agree that whether you think it was a great win or a weird win or whatever chamonix was just it was funky here at briansson this felt like a really big win and an important win as well kind of in the classic Yanya way. I saw this as just the quintessential Yanya Garnbrett gold medal performance where you have a number of the women come out before her and get stymied at various points on the route, 18 plus, 37 or 37 plus, whatever it was, 41. And then Yanya comes out and just kind of outgrits everybody and and just kind of puts on this textbook performance of getting just a little higher than everybody else just proving that she is a little better than everybody else uh it just like i said this is like classic yanya what's interesting as well is it sets up we have a little break here and then we're going to slovenia that always does interesting things uh in when comps are held in the home country of people right some people are able to shine because of it some people it has the opposite effect for whatever reason, nerves or, or what. So there's some intrigue there. We'll see what happens with Yanya when this thing goes to Slovenia. And finally, I don't know if Yanya ever, I don't think she ever actually vocalized that she was tr- hoping or intending to sweep the lead circuit. I think people kind of put that on her. Although you can, I mean, like, why wouldn't you try to do that? Right. You try to win every competition you can, uh, so what? whether she vocalized it or not, she's, you know, we're now getting into the, the midway point of this lead season and she's doing just that. She's sweeping it. So that also creates intrigue to see if she'll, she can continue with that. I think once you cross the halfway point, it's going to be a conversation for anybody. It doesn't matter who it is, whether or not there's as much hype as there is for someone like Yanya because she's proven she can sweep a season already. Uh, if anybody gets four in a row in a season yeah that's of course what the discussion is going to be about and even more so for somebody that's proven capable i'll i'll say like i mean at least for the few people i've heard it from we didn't invent this this notion of her sweeping the season ahead of time that was a conversation point that came from places where where you could say okay maybe there is discussion going on somewhere in slovenia about this topic and and maybe it's you know garbage from uh from people that are just uh, uh kind of close to her but i i mean we didn't invent this talking point ourselves at the start of the season. You know, you're hearing little tidbits from from people here and there. And I mean, I think it fits with the theme of, OK, you're already being called the, the greatest of all time by a lot of people. So what what can you achieve this year? What are we going to do? What's going to keep you motivated? Why come back? Right. What uh, what is it that's going to make you put in the hard hours again for another season when you've won the Olympic gold and, and all that stuff. So I think it's a completely worthwhile thing for everybody to be talking about whether or not Yanya wants it to, uh, 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 to be as, as a dominant a discussion point from so early in a season. 
it, it's something that she's just going to have to live with at this point, considering we know it's possible. So that's just how it goes. Um, yeah. That, that's a big part of it, how you finish it, is young, you just have to live with it. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you're that good, you are the narrative. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Natalia, I think it was your interview with her, John, she's very much discovered the same thing, that when you become the narr- na- the sorry, when you become the narrative, you get more positivity, but you also get more negativity and you get much more focus in people's opinion of you than if you're just another climber in the pack. You know, people really want to talk about the the tall daisies, the ones that stick their heads out. And Yanya's classic for that, Natalia's discovering that. I, I personally don't think it was a very good comp for Yanya. Hmm. She didn't win qualifiers. She was behind um, Che and Seo. She didn't win semi. She was behind Natsuki Tani. Now, if they had set a soft final... Which, which is a risk, and that's the horrible thing, but it's a risk. She wouldn't have been in a position to win, and we saw that so many times in 2019, and that was what really beat up Yanya psychologically was when she wouldn't have the best pre-finals climbs, and she might be second or third, which you're thinking, oh, that's still fantastic, but then she didn't have a chance to improve her place because there was multiple tops, or everyone falls off at the identical spot. Um, So I don't think she would consider it, even though her social media was positive, I don't think she would consider it a great comp because she left herself vulnerable to the root setting. Yeah, that's a a totally fair point. That's uh, well said. I I guess I was thinking more of a quintessential or classic Yanya final round. But certainly, yeah, when you look at the other rounds, she probably left some an opening there more so than she would have wanted for Natsuki or, or whoever Cheon or whoever to to take that win yeah um and and <laughs> yeah gosh that would have been awful if like there would have just been this bottleneck at the top in the finals and it goes back to count back to semis luckily that didn't happen let me let me throw throw the like the classic talking point of well if you're that good a climber you don't you know, you don't put in 110% in the qualifiers and semifinals. You save as much as you can for finals. That's a, 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 a theory that comes up. And I think a lot of the times it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, uh, maybe pushed a little bit too far, but there is a certain element when you say I'm the best one here. I know that my performance on most days will be enough to get me to finals. So I don't need to grind out like my skin to death i don't need to be throwing myself out just to try and make semifinals or just to make finals now eddie you you mentioned what the risks are of not finishing first in qualifiers or semifinals not just from root setting but you know the the nightmare scenario is you get rained out or something like that and you literally don't have a chance to defend uh, uh or come back but there's got to be some element to that for yanya where she's not questioning that you know so long as she has a typical performance in qualifiers or semifinals, she's going to make it through to the final round, right? Yeah, I think she's only missed finals one time in lead from memory in all the World Cups. Um, so she, you know, she's consistent in doing that, and it's it's a walk in the park for her, so to speak. But uh, yeah, I think when you're climbing at that level, and she's such a perfectionist. Uh, and you know she'll she'll tell you all day long she's a perfectionist, and I you for me I I see what John says because I think her finals climb was a textbook example of perfect Yanya climbing, but I must admit after semis I was like oh please don't do a Chamonix final, you know I I was scared for her because you know I love it a bit she's an absolutely lovely person. And I always want these World Cups one on merit in the final, not one on merit over the comp, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, you know, Tyler, if I, I, I think whether or not there is credence to that idea, I, I can't say. I mean, we are not elite level competitors. We're, we've never had to strategize like that ourselves. And, and I don't have an inside track into what Roman and Yanya are, are doing. But I, I can say, I think if it was me, after Chamonix happened, I would be thinking, okay, I'm going to go all out in every quality round and every semifinal round because this year, the route setting, 
who knows what you're going to get in that final round. Chamonix proved that. I would not want to risk that again uh, this season. I would not want to risk having another final round like Chamonix. So I would I would not leave it up to just, oh, I'm going to go 75% in qualities and 75% in semis and then go all out in finals. I, that, that would be a... I think that would be a risk after Chamonix. Can I can I quickly interject here, sorry, because I wasn't in the Chamonix debrief. And there's been a big narrative about the route setting in Chamonix. And I actually think that's a little bit unfair on the route setters. Because my belief from being to Chamonix many times is that the difficulty of a route is very much dictated to the route setters by the organizers. And the route setters did a great job of what the organizers wanted. It's just not what the sport wanted or what the sport needed. But I think it's sort of unfair that so many people are called out the root setters since then, where realistically, if you look in Chamonix a few years ago, I think there's five guys top in finals. Um, there's been many comps with multiple, multiple tops in Chamonix because the organizers always push that the crowd loves a top. And I think they've got a little bit out of control in it. And, I, you know, we always say the route setting, and I actually feel bad for those setters because I think those setters were just doing what they were told. Sh- I, don't we... think, I don't think it was badly set. I think it was set to a bad plan. Sh- sure. Well, to clarify, yeah, I don't, you know, if we say route setting, then maybe we don't mean the, the setting from the setters, more just the routes on the wall. Whoever... Whoever is responsible for that many tops, be it the people, you know, uh, people with the bolts or whether it's the people that are organizing or whatever. Um, yeah, that that's I think that's where the criticism is more so than the individual people that were working the wrenches and stuff. But, I, you know, I don't know. Too what? many tops, though, in Chamonix, <laughs> whoever oh, is responsible, whoever, whoever was it was it was due to there were too many tops. Uh, my headline for this is uh, is half half of Eddie's. My my headline for this is uh, Jesse Grouper and Taisei Homa, um, and it, this might be a little bit of a stretch. And I'm I'm putting this headline out into the universe, kind of hoping it manifests, because to me I'm feeling like I'm starting to sense the seeds of what might be an actual storyline in the men's lead podium which compared to women's climbing is much harder to find at the very top level. Um, when you look at women's podiums, you see very consistent winners uh, over uh, over time. There's they're often recurring characters that you'll always see in finals uh, or in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the podium itself. Of course, we're seeing that right now where there's, I believe, six women that have made every final so far this year. Five of them have, have, uh, have won medals so far. Natsuki Tani is the one that's still waiting for her medal uh, in 2022. Uh, but yeah, Yanya every every final, uh, Natalia every final, Lara every final, Chayan every final, Brooke every final, Natsuki every final, and this this these six women become an incredible story just by themselves. On men's, you get so much inconsistency in the top of the field uh, that it's really difficult to to start pinning these narratives on climbers because they very easily drop out of finals, and finals is frankly where the compelling stories happen. Taisei and Jesse are, are two of, I think, only four competitors that have made three out of four finals. Yannick is actually the most consistent. He's been in every final so far, but he hasn't been on a podium just yet. Uh, but Taisei and Jesse both so far three medals uh, out of the four comps that they've been in. And what makes them kind of extra intriguing is that they are new faces at that level for the most part. Again, Taisei won a silver back a couple of years ago and, and Jesse had a, a couple of finals in the past as well. But it's fresh to see them on the podium and fresh to start to really pay attention to them, knowing of what they're capable of after each competition. And I mean, I'm trying to think of the last time that I felt I could see something this consistent from new climbers was for me almost thinking back to when all the hype was being built around Sean McCall, when in lead, at least when him and like Sachiyama were starting to compete with Adam Andra and, and Jakob Schubert had been, you know, winning for a couple of years at this point. And there was starting to be a cohort of guys where for a year or two, it was, it was a cutthroat scene and you never know who is going to win. And they were all winning here and there. Um, there is a chance that that's going to happen again. And three competitions or four competitions, 
does not make a narrative by itself. And it's still going to take a bit of time before the names Jesse Gruper and Taisei Homa elevate out of the world of people who watch these comps live, right? Like we're still not seeing their faces on every conversation about World Cup climbing. They're not going to beat out the narratives of Alex Magos or, or even an Olympian like Colin Duffy. They're not there yet. But give them a couple more comps and I feel like they will start to rise to the top of what the layman climber, what the gym climber is talking about. And if they're winning and making every finals and, and just regular people are, are talking about them, uh, that becomes something we haven't seen for a really long time in men's competition climbing where you can tune into a men's final and almost expect to see your favorite people there every single time and in contention for a medal. So I know it's really early to call. We're only halfway through the season and it is but one season. Whereas for women, it can last a decade with, with the, the most legendary climbers. Um, but I, I have, I have, a, I have, uh, what's that, what's that line? I can't remember who it's from, but a, a deep hope and a fervent prayer that these guys are, are going to be mainstays of a new generation of, of male lead climbers. Uh, and it's got me really optimistic right now. Uh, so that is my headline from, uh, from this competition. Yeah, I think that that's a really good one because we are seeing, it's not necessarily young blood or even new blood, but fresh blood, like, in the men's ranks. And their consistency is what really makes them stand out. Because, you know, across bouldering and lead, there's far less consistency in men's results. Mm -hmm. um, you only have to look at the last couple of seasons of bouldering that there's never one guy winning more than one comp in a season. Yeah. And you kind of get the feeling that Leeds going that way as well. And it's really, you know, I don't know whether it's because a couple of climbers aren't there or whatever, but you, you can only recognize the comp on the people that are there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they're climbing fantastic. So it's really, it makes it much more engaging to watch when, and also this is a big one for the climbing diehards is if you watch Youth Worlds and watch Youth Results and you know who Tassai Homer is, you know who Jesse Gruper is, you know who Colin Duffy is, and you, you see them from in the 13-14, it's great to then see that realised on the big stage. Because when you watch them as a kid, they're only ever competing at their age or a year younger or a year older. But you can really see the kids that do stand out as a bit special. And so it's great then to see later these same kids you know on the top of an adult podium and going yeah they were a bit special let me let me pose a pose a question just because i we always talk about kids in youth worlds in a retrospective attitude where we rarely talk about oh there's this you know 14 year old kid coming out of wherever and keep an eye out for them in 10 years so let me let me ask you a question not not of a not of a current youth climber but of somebody that's kind of in the same boat just slightly younger uh, only by like a year or two, but somebody we saw in finals, uh, Philip Schenk from, from Italy, who is also somebody who is a consistent player at the Youth World Championships. Um, just asking for your spidey senses, Eddie, is somebody who shot him for, for many years. I think his first year was 2014 in Youth Worlds, if, 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 if I'm running the numbers right. Um, what kind of vibes do you get off a climber like that? He's an interesting one because I don't really understand where he went. Hmm. His, traje his trajectory was amazing. And then I don't know whether it was because of college or whether it was because of life or an injury or whatever, but around 2018, 2019, when you expected him to be stepping into the upper echelon, he really disappeared, pretty much disappeared from the Italian team, um, was in a bit of a vacuum. And I'm, as I said, I'm not sure why. You know, it could be as simple as they didn't think he was in running for the combined, so they didn't put him in the combined team. It could, you know, um, because a lot of countries back then were tweaking their World Cup squads around Olympic qualification, and that could have shut him out for a while. Um, but phenomenally talented, has yet to realise that talent, as I'm just saying these other guys have. You know, the fact that this was uh, Philippe Schenk's first final and you're like, how? When you got someone like Alberto, who's been in like every sure, final yeah. in 2019. <laughs> yeah, and three years thing. younger, yeah. 
Well, yeah. Or like, two years but younger. But yeah. Two or three, yeah. And that's the that's sort of where we all expected Philip to be. You know, there's a, there's a few climbers watching youth that, that there was the narrative before they left youth. Mm-hmm. You know, Yanya Gumbret, before she was <laughs> eligible to climb in adults, everyone said, oh my God, watch this kid. Ariane Batone, before she could climb adults, everyone said, oh my God, watch this kid. And very interesting there, because you look at Yanya, how they brought her into World Cups. And they bought her in so carefully. They only gave her a few World Cups in her first year. They really eased her in gently, built up the number of World Cups she did every year because they were very, the coaches were very afraid of burning her out. Mm-hmm. And Oriane starts every year fantastically and dips every year. And it's like, were the Slovenians onto something? You know, they protected their asset, whereas the French just seem to throw their assets at every comp and then if they get burnt out that's tough luck that's a great comparison that's a a, a vivid super vivid image yeah john do you have anything uh, on on the jesse the taise well are you a closet closet philip fan since since 2014 or anything (laughs) not closet not closeted i i'm a big fan for sure uh the the interesting thing about all this is it just makes me realize how much the women's division really has kind has lightning in a bottle in the sense of we say that you have the uh, some consistency at the top of the women's field consistency from competition to competition on the podium and the thinking is like oh maybe now we could have that in the men's division too maybe we'll see with Tyce and Jesse etc but it's kind of like wow even if there's consistency at the men that like that consistency is not the sole thing that makes the women's division so compelling right now. It's it's also that the women, beyond just ha- recurring the same handful of women, final to final to final, it's that they fit these archetypes that I don't know if we'll ever see again, in that you have the greatest of all time, potentially, right? You know, sort of like widely regarded as the greatest of all time in Yanya Garnbret. And then you have... A couple years ago, you had the rookie phenom in Cheon So that is able to to like overtake the the queen, right? She's able to take the throne from her. So compelling. And then on top of that, now you have Brooke and Natalia, who kind of represent the the whole U.S. scene and the surge that the whole American team has made over the last like two years and 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 now they're kind of putting some more pressure at the top of that podium there are just all these x factors beyond just the fact that it's consistent at the top of the women's podium and I don't mean to take away from your point Tyler I think what you said is very true about Jesse and uh and 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 Tysay but I'm just when comparing the men's division and what consistency would add to it to the consistency at the women's division I'm I'm just thinking like wow no the women's division, though, still has this such a magical puzzle pieces all falling into place over the last couple of years. It's just great stuff. It makes you really appreciate it because, like I said, I don't know if we'll ever have that again in any division. And I'll, I'll, I'll just before Eddie pops in, the one thing that I find really satisfying about the women's field, because my point is really just about how rare it is in the men's, but because we're talking about it in the women's, I want people to contrast this field of women, which Yanya may be about to sweep over compared to the women who Yanya got her bouldering sweep over in 2019. Take a look at all the talent that she's climbing against right now, and pretty much all of them you would consider to be proven talent for one regard or another, whether it's winning many competitions or being consistent meddlers, beating Yanya in the past at different competitions, being on the Olympic team and then following that up with success at World Cups, right? Uh, not to mention the people that aren't making finals consistently, but, you know, uh, former champions like Jesse Pills. Uh, there's still these people just, you know, a, f- a few places behind the rest of this crowd. Whereas you look at the 2019 season where you can say, oh, there's all these unproven young talents and then old talent that is aging out or, you know, almost in a walker just trying to make it through the next season. That's That was a bit of a stray. I don't mean to, <laughs> don't mean to wreck anybody. But the the contrast between this season and that season... I, I, I really want people to to look at those two to just to contextualize that streak of 2019 and frankly, how much more impressive this streak will be 
uh, if it does in fact happen. And even if it doesn't, winning five out of seven or winning six out of seven this year could easily be a bigger accomplishment than winning the six World Cups in 2019 if you just look, in my opinion, at the at the strength of the field. Uh, but anyway, Eddie, you had a point. Hopefully I didn't make you forget it. Uh, you might want to say something about no, that. No, totally no. up to you. I, I, I sort of want to rebut yours slightly because I actually am in disagreement. Sure. I think, for instance, if you look at this year's bouldering, Mm-hmm. you would say that that was a far more depleted field than what um, Yanya faced in 2019. Um, I think there was Natalia and then a big gulf to anyone else competitive. Um, and uh, up because until Yan- the end. Because up until the end with, there. with Hana, Hana Moyle, up until the last two comps. I think that go- yes, I think that golf got good, closer. But then, how good do you consider Hannah is? So, um, because you know Hannah's a great kid, but she's not been at that level. So does that mean that Natalia's kind of? Because you got to remember, they both got four tops in those last two comps. So you could you could argue that maybe Natalia wasn't being pushed to a limit because they were. But anyway. Um, we're, we're diverging here from what I wanted to say, which I feel the women's field in general has got a little bit more of, for instance, in tennis, where you had Nadal, Federer, Djokovic. And I feel women's climbing's a bit like that, where you've got Yanya, you've got Natalia, you've got Shea and So, you've got these other um, girls that are very talented as well. And... In a comp where Natalia loses to Yanya, I don't think that diminishes Natalia. In a comp where um, Che and So beat Yanya, I don't think that diminishes Yanya, you know, and so on through the... Because I think they all raise the standard for all of them. And what we're seeing now is... Should be a compliment to all those girls and not... Yeah, I don't know if I'm wording it correctly, but we're, we're basically, we're seeing... I think three, arguably four stellar careers all in an upwards trajectory. Related to that, one of the talking points, I I can't remember if it was a co-commentator that brought it up or what, but one of the things that came up during this Brienne song final round was this notion that Yanya doesn't really have anything to gain and everything to lose. I think that's almost more or less how it was phrased. Yeah, uh, Alana dropped something like that. Like she has everything to lose yeah. or, or something like yeah, that in a you, moment. I did you, catch that. Do you all think that that is a, a fair, uh, you know, with all due respect to Alana, who, you know, we're, we're huge fans of here on the show, do you all think that's a, a fair assessment that Yanya doesn't have really anything to gain beyond just like winning one more event, right, each time? nothing else to really gain and everything to lose. How do you feel about that? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. So? Because for everyone, winning is the exception. For Yanya, winning is the rule. When winning is the rule, what does it take to get to that exception? So it's like, I think it's much tougher because, because yeah, it's win number 32, win number 33, however many, uh, you know, no one can even keep count. And to me, that loads up the pressure because everyone's waiting for failure. Mm-hmm. And no one's waiting to go, that was great. Everyone's waiting to go, oh, she didn't do as well as she could have. And then people will go, does that mean she's not the greatest of all time? Or is she over it? Or, oh my God, she's 23. Maybe she's too old. Or, oh, you know, it, it opens <laughs> you up. Call it, you world. called out all my talking points. Jeez. Well, but, but, but don't, don't you think, though, that in that sense, though, Eddie, I, sorry to cut you off, but like if she, okay, if she loses one comp, and and I'm sure that there <laughs> there would be people and pundits that would act like the world is, is ending, uh, you know, obviously that it wouldn't be, but like, I'm sure you would get this hyperbole, but I feel like it'd just be one loss among untold winnings. And if Yanya then goes back and wins the next event, I think people would just kind of like, forget about that loss. Like, I think it's, it's almost like she's stacked up so many wins that it's like, she could afford to lose a couple and still like, 
she's kind of unscathed, you know. But let, let me ask you, how far into this lead season were we before people started talking about a sweep? A, a comp? Like day one. It, it was day the, one. I, I, I will <laughs> say, I first you know. heard about it. At, I, won't, I won't reveal my sources. I first heard rumblings about it at the bouldering yeah. event. So it wasn't and, even the start of the so, lead season. So, you know, that's just like winning's not good enough. She I think has that, to do something more. I was going to say that that is that is the context where it we're really not talking about her losing a World Cup. You know, is is devastating. It's the fact that if she loses a World Cup, that means she loses the streak, and at this point, the streak is everything, right? Like, if, does she need another World Cup? Only if you're comparing her against the ultimate greats. And honestly, I think there is something worthwhile. She's building a legacy, right? After a few competitions oh, from yeah. now, after a season Absolutely. or two, she'll have beaten everybody that ever came before in terms of medals. And at that point, you are trying, you're competing against the future. You're competing against the unknown athlete 10 or 20, 30 years from now, who you're just trying to hold them off and see how long your, your legacy can go on. And maybe it lives longer than you do, right? And that's really hard to stay motiv motivated for. That's impossible. But it, it is a reality. Whereas for everybody else in the field, winning the World Cup is about just getting that medal. Whereas for Yanya, Winning the World Cup is about just keeping up the endless struggle to win as many in a row as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and for instance, we don't even talk with Yanya. There's not even narrative about will she win the season. Anyone else is like, will they win the season? Yanya mm -hmm. is so... Oh, it's just Yanya. Well, I mean, nobody else has the option she, at this point, right? Like, she's the only one it, in contention for sweeping the season at this point. <laughs> but e even though she lost it in 2019 to Che and So... Um, didn't she, I think? Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, she's won it multiple times before and people just like, it's sweep or bust. And it's like, no, mm. it's, it's, this is her year between Olympic qualifications and Olympics and stuff to effectively climb for fun. And I don't know how much fun is left when people just load up on her. And, and I think that's why she... To me, the Sh the post Shamini Instagram was really telling because mm -hmm. it's one of the few times you've ever seen Yanya go. Screw this, mm -hmm. this isn't good enough. Your outside forces are threatening my my place in the sport, my my legacy. Sure. You know, outside forces, be it the organizers or setters or whoever is creating easy routes. Are, are putting my legacy in jeopardy and I don't train this hard for that. I don't get up every morning and work my ass up and watch what I eat and watch what I do and go to sleep at the right time just so someone can go, oh, five tops will be a good show for the crowd. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was angry and that's very out of character for Yanya in the media to show that. I, th I think in a weird way, though, it. I think she... Gained a lot. She already has tons of fans. I don't know if you can say she gained more fans, but I, I definitely think fans really appreciated that assertiveness, assertiveness from her. I saw so many retweets of a re Instagram, whatever reposts of that Instagram message that she posted about the Chamonix World Cup with the headline. People said like, "Oh, the Queen speaks." You know, like it was, it was almost like, like here is the 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 voice that really matters about this topic it's from this this woman that is chasing history here and you don't want it to be ruined or wrecked by it, 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 something as you know um something as kind of simple as too many tops in the field or something like that it was really yeah. it was really great to see that kind of fan response and respect that she got from that post where she opened up and like you said Eddie she doesn't really open up in that way all that often so that was really great I, the thing you got to remember is that these people are athletes and opening up actually shows vulnerability and there are people there with gamesmanship who will play on that um you know there's always the story of jan hoyer making adam andre cry back in the day at the bouldering world cups because i think it was maybe 2015 where he'd walk up to Adam in isolation at every World Cup and go, oh, Adam, when was the last time you won a Boulder World Cup? Oh, five years? Oh, wow. That's... And then just walk away. Every comp. A and then in the end, in Munich, he said that to Adam. And Adam's like, but I'm world champion. And 
Jan's like, yeah, but you still can't win a World Cup, can you? And just walked away and, and was completely beating Adam up inside his head. And, and that gamesmanship, you don't necessarily see so much from the outside, but there are people that'll play that. So whenever, some, whenever an athlete shows a vulnerability, they are opening it up for, you know, I'm not saying Natalia would play that game or Brooke or Chay and so or anything. I'm not saying they'd go up to Yanya and go, here, it's an easy set this week. Best, you better top it in under three minutes or you're going to lose. My but, bets on Natsuki Tani is just a huge troll in ISO. That's my, yeah. I can just tell by looking at her. She's that person, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I wish we had in some degree a, a bit more transparency to what went on in ISO. I think it would shock a lot of people. I, you know, the old days of Shauna Coxie going and seeing the new girls and just making sure she ripped off a couple of one arms in front of them just sure. to demoralize them before they ever, <laughs> you, you know, one of the French girls used to climb up and climb along and traverse along and stand on the hands of the girls tra- warming up below her. Uh, there's all these things that happen in isolation, which are nasty. And yeah. So, and people don't realize that and they applaud Yanya for showing the vulnerability and the openness and stuff, but they don't realize that one of the reasons they don't, and it's probably the exact same reason Natalia's always smiling. It's a defense. That's a good way to wrap up our segment on Taisei Hama and Jesse Grouper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on to, uh, to, to, that was, that was actually my, my favorite part of the conversation. Uh, that was great. Let's move on to our winners. Um, uh, I, I am going to start this one off because mine's actually pretty short and you guys can uh, can elaborate on it and then go on to your points. So mine's going to be the root setting, which my understanding was Eddie was going to make that his loser. So so I just want to be clear that by me calling the root setting a winner, I'm talking about a gambling win. I'm talking about going into the casino and and having the bet of your life. I mean, I like talking like huge bet on shit cards, and it just so happens the other players fold just because they're scared of your bet. Um, root setters won uh, pretty much by pure luck. So my negative point: I thought the roots were really boring. Uh, same color from from the ground to the top same like hold families from the bottom to the top i found myself yawning i found myself checking out you're looking at kind of the just the same steady visuals the entire time up also for the most part there was a limited amount of 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 actual movement that kind of broke up the pace of the climb um the one thing i did like though is that it was pretty consistent across the board that the climbing was a little bit unsettled. And I thought it was fun, particularly in the men and then at the women's crux, that there was a lot of uncertainty. And I felt you could see the climbers really second guessing their movements and, and being like, oh, do I actually want to approach that? Hold in this particular way is the beta that I was thinking about just a moment ago, really the best way to do this. And that was fun to watch. Uh, because I mean, there's a bunch of climbers in this competition that you think of as composed uh, and as steady and and confident, and it, it made them kind of, uh, kind of think twice about how they approach the next moves, which I thought was a fun angle, although maybe not the most fun to climb. Honestly, I kind of watched some of those routes and I was like, that looks like my nightmare. And there wasn't it wasn't necessarily um, one of those comps where it's just hard showy moves. It was just they looked kind of almost uncomfortable the entire way up in terms of do you trust this hold or that hold. Um, but the real win was the fact that two fairly cruxy sections managed to get broken by the winners. Uh, if you look at both the men and the women, kind of the top three, top four, top five climbers were in these very difficult uh, sections for the men. It was kind of that semi-blind throw with the right hand to the side pull crimp. For the women, it was in that face section where you're spread out and you're trying to kind of wrap these little sloper dishes and and honestly you could almost say it was by by the toss of a coin from god that jesse grouper and yanya managed to get those one extra moves beyond where everybody else fell um so the root setting itself was kind of a coin toss for me it looked boring as shit but it was a nice change of pace compared to the last comps in terms of the style but the fact that we got a winner born out of finals rather than countbacks was extremely sketchy uh so the root setters survived this one uh they got a pass because there were no uh countbacks for the gold medal but it was real close it could have been a, a rough competition i think let's look at the separation here uh in the finals pulled it up so for the women 
18 plus, 18 plus, 37 plus, 37 plus, 41, 41, 41 plus, and then Yanya's 42 plus to win it. Yeah, that's basically then, three holds separating the top, like, what, five, five women? Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. That's and tough. then the, yeah. the men finalists, there were nine of them. Yep. 18 plus, 25, 27, 34 plus, 34 plus, 35 plus, 35 plus, 35 plus. So that was kind of that little bottleneck. And then 37, Jesse. Jesse gets the one, two, just above that, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I love that separation. I mean, I think there was a lot of, probably unfairly, because it's not exactly the same crew, but, like, unfair pressure on this Brianson the, the route setters here because it's like whatever you do we cannot have another competition where it's four women top or whatever four men top that would be awful as well I just feel like especially with social media being the way it is people are quick to to point out when they're unsatisfied with something I think this would have been a disaster if we had seen a Chamonix part two here with the route setting I was hoping it was going to be just good separation because I didn't want to have that negativity come into this. Luckily, it didn't. And the separation ended up being great, as we just heard. So See, It's yeah. funny because you say that, and I think the separation was terrible, all comp. I think if you look at men's semis, there was no separation. Only you final know, round. They... Only I'm only talking final <laughs> round. But even, <laughs> even final, you had like five of the guys within the space of two holds, yeah. five of the girls within the space of... if. We used to describe it as pumper to a boulder problem when we were talking about the roots, um, that some World Cup roots are pumper to a boulder problem, and the boulder problem would always be on the head wall, and it might be 8B plus pumper to an 8A plus boulder. Mm -hmm. a and so if you were fit, you were always going to get to the boulder problem, and then it just came down to two or three moves. So the, just, the, the angle but, softens but people, up and the holds stiffen all of a sudden and your hands are wrecked. Like, yeah, it's, it, it is the recipe yeah. for, for a, a crux right there at the, or just over the lip. And, and also it's a recipe because it's kind of where you want people to fall in terms of it's a safer fall because you're falling out from the wall. It's, you know, there's, it's obviously better for the crowd. It's, there, there's a bunch of things that go into it, but, um, it's a very common style of root setting and lead, um, and it is pretty popular. I think a lot of the climbers prefer multiple stiffening cruxes, whereas I think these roots were very consistent until the headwall. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that fell off low generally, for instance, are Vita and the Japanese girl whose name sits my head in finals. They just screwed up. Mm -hmm. They misread the sequence. It wasn't that it was necessarily very hard um same in the guys and yeah so the re but that's not the reason i had the roots as a or the um the roots as my possible loser i had my roots as my possible loser because you had a gray wall and then white and black roots that really blended into it and there was as, as i'm talking finals here mm -hmm. and if you look or teal or whatever and if you looked away and looked back you wouldn't really know where on the route there was it was so two-dimensional yes um that i found visually it wasn't very engaging and i you know i watched the comp quite late because i was doing other other things and with time zones it's middle of the night for me a and i found it i struggled to remain engaged because yes it looked very two-dimensional so I like the previous comps where they kind of went uh, by color mm -hmm. to tell how high you were. I thought that was a really great sort of advancement if you had the blue zone, then the green zone, then the yellow zone or whatever, but you could see just at a glance, oh, okay, they're this far up the route. Whereas now when they're running the close-ups, you're like, eh, they're, the, on, a, the, they're you, on a white hold with a black edge. I was going to say, you know it's boring when your accent color on the wall is what they would paint a hospital hallway that's when you realize you're in the in the snoozer zone for the uh, for the color scheme of the comp yeah and it was, for the we record talking... it was mint for the record it was mint not not teal i thought we were talking about the winners here though i i mean i'm i'm in, in agreement well, again with again my said, but we it's like we're we're talking about how we didn't like the routes and and this is the winners category that's that's just how it goes on the debrief there's nothing positive really it's just all negative 
Well, well, the thing is, one person's win, it doesn't have to be everyone's. Just the sure. same as one person's lose, it doesn't have to be everyone's. And, you know, I think for sure the Roots were an improvement over what we saw in Chamonix. But, I, you know, I would hope that just the same as a couple of years they started to introduce blockers because it was a step in the right direction. I hope that they introduce colours as a step in the right direction to, mm-hmm. you, as in bracketed colours, so it goes yeah. by its own. Because I think things like that are really spectator friendly. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, especially when it's not just diff- changes in colors, but also changes in shapes. It, it, uh, it uh, you know, the <laughs> what, what was it? The club penguin section, which all of us are a little too old for, but the the blue volumes at at uh, Innsbruck kind of formed the logo to a to a, a kids video game from like the late two thousands. Whether or not it was intentional, but uh, it came up in the Discord earlier. But yeah, you get you get visual contrast. That's nice. Anyway, I I I um, John, what was uh, what was your winner from this? Uh, uh, event. I'll kind of keep it brief because I feel like I've mentioned this person before as a winner this season, but I would have to say Cheon So because if you look at her season, her, her, her year, let's go into the Boulder season as well. She starts really low, not really low, but you know, low ish. She got like 25th in Seoul or something like that in that Boulder Cup. Then she gets a fifth in Salt Lake, she gets a fifth in Innsbruck. Solid boulder season, considering she's you know, generally not, considered not to be a boulder. lead specialist. <laughs> yeah, at least she was and up until this season, mm-hmm. considered a lead specialist. And then here, when the lead season starts, second in Innsbruck, sixth in Villar. So it's not a podium, but she still makes finals. Uh, third in Chamonix and second here in Briançon. She's one of those competitors that has made finals at every competition this season. And just like a second, a second. That's, it's so good. Uh, and I guess what I think about Cheyenne is, okay, sure. She's in the Yanya era, which is, that's like extra hard for anybody. And and Cheyenne is not winning these competitions. She's second place, third place, silver and bronze and all that. But she's up there every time, pretty much. And so I have to think, inevitably, when there is this, the next generation turnover whether it's in a couple years or five years or who knows whenever that happens Cheon is really positioning herself she's gaining experience and gaining top of the podium experience to really position herself well to be that leader when the generational turnover does happen whenever it happens and I just think that that's great I'm so excited for Cheon. she just continues to be so consistent so consistently good at such a young age it's great i think uh going back to 2019 that year where we did see all this young talent come out and of course cheyenne had the the breakout season kind of almost of the decade considering yanya's uh yanya's debut season was was um uh was kind of um uh what's the word i'm looking for it was kind of held back a little bit by the team you know but you know cheyenne's debut season was tremendous uh, and there were other climbers that, that came out strong that year and, and some of them we haven't seen back again. And it is just nice to see see those climbers still in the game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing I really enjoyed this weekend was when they interviewed Chan. So because, I, you know, I've, I know her, I know she can speak English. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was sort of surprised after the interview of how many comments I saw of, oh my goodness, she, you know, <laughs> she can speak English. It's like, yeah, she can. It's just, you know, they don't often talk to her. Mm-hmm. But, it, I, you know, it's it's nice to get that personality, her talking about her rivalry rivalry with Yanya and how it pushes her. And I was like, nice. You yeah. know, added dimension. Yeah. yeah. I Honestly, hearing the word rivalry come out of an athlete's mouth is crazy refreshing. As much as, you know, Cheyenne wasn't leaning into it or anything like that. She wasn't stoking the flames of some some conflict. But just saying the word out loud is a huge step. You know, we're all, we're all in therapy right now. Just kind of kind of admitting that that these 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 things in your head do exist sometimes i i love it. it's i mean that's what that's what really sells that's what that's what makes this these things go the extra step right it's is when there is there are these rivalries it doesn't always have to be antagonistic it can be a friendly rivalry think back to uh you know Anna store and melissa Leneve and and julie verm like they were great friends and yet they were embroiled in 
several battles in 2013, 2014 in the finals and stuff of Boulder seasons. So that's yeah, great. It's great. Oh, there's geez, another rivalries are awesome. There's another archetypal cohort of just five or six women that are every single competition, the same people in finals. I so day after day after day like that's that's another crew to, that you hopefully this set of women in lead rivals that one in terms of how long they uh, they stick together yeah we live in hope yes yeah. uh eddie what was your uh, winner for this event uh let, let's go quick because we've been talking a while so i don't think we need sure to yeah you're starting this. to yawn it's uh it's uh it is is it no, late no, over I, there I, is it is it is it almost <laughs> bedtime when <laughs> i i had to get up early um <laughs> When you're a writer, you keep odd hours. And no, I was just kidding about the keeping it brief, just because you know I know John will want to interject and support what I'm saying here. <laughs> yeah, my, John's, my big... John's the long-winded one when uh, when Eddie's on the show. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> well, no, just just because my winner was one that I'm sure John would have wanted to oh, take, course. which yeah. which is Team USA. Sure. Um, because I remember it wasn't that many podcasts ago i remember watching a podcast and hearing someone say where is all the usa men at that the woman you know natalia brooke etc had had a fantastic season but the men hadn't really shown up and the men have shown up mm -hmm. um they just needed some prodding and, you know but, yeah <laughs> they just had to follow the lead of the females you know the females were getting it right and the guys had to pay attention and copy but um, I think it really is a testament to the effort that's gone into USA Climbing over the last four or five years of building that team and developing a culture that they approach the comps so differently now. And you can really see that not just in the results, but in the mindset. And it's, um, it's fascinating to me because... Yeah, I, I mentioned it briefly with Jesse earlier that you had the the college dropout years, which is not that you drop out of college, you drop out of climbing for college. Right. And, and now climbing's Olympic. It's a little bit more mainstream and maybe you're not going to stop it for college. Maybe you're going to try and make the two work side by side or you're going to defer college or something. Because I think a lot of Americans maybe never reached their potential because in that critical formative time they got deflected into doing something else with their lives and now the focus is far more on performance climbing and you can get sponsors and you can make a living and you can drive a ford bronco and you know so i think it's for me it's excellent to see the you know, when I started going to World Cups, the Americans that, show, and for years, the Americans that showed up were traveling on their own or, you know, Sean Bailey traveling around Europe and the Fiat 500 sleeping across the back seat. And Fiat 500 is a tiny, for those of you that don't know. Um, you know, people traveling with their mums. I'd quite often travel with Josh Larson back in the day and it'd be like, oh, let's have a team dinner. And you message all the team and half of them don't show up because they're out to dinner with their mum or, you know, and all that's gone now. Now it is team and you're seeing the, you're seeing the results. And I'm, yeah, I think that's brilliant. John, any reflection before I derail this with a Bronco joke? The, the college thing is interesting because I also think that has kind of been a byproduct of the pandemic in a way, which is to say, the pandemic happened, and right around the same time, USA Climbing was relocating to Salt Lake City. And during the pandemic, in the United States, as well as, I assume, everywhere around the world, a lot of colleges, if not all colleges, went remote for that 2020 year. It, it, whether kids, students moved back home with their parents, or whether they just stayed in their dorm room, but they they didn't actually attend in-person class. All college, they all went online, and I think for the top-level climbers, a lot of them, maybe that was kind of a, a realization of like, hey, I can take remote college classes and relocate to Salt Lake City, right? Like, and I can continue to train. I can train with the U.S. national team 
and still go to college and do it remotely. And that's fully acceptable nowadays, post pandemic. Uh, like nobody kind of like looks curiously when you say you're doing remote online college classes or something like that, like they might have 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, so I think that that has kind of added to it maybe in a way. It's weird to say like a silver lining of the pandemic because the pandemic's just been awful all around. But I do think it kind of opened people's eyes up to the idea of remote online learning for colleges. And and a lot of the top climbers in the U.S. are definitely relocating to Salt Lake City. So yeah. it, it won't last. Like in saying that Salt Lake City won't last. I, I don't know that Salt Lake City... It's the fashionable location at the moment, but I, I I still think in four or five years things will maybe slide back towards Boulder. The the Salt Lake bubble doesn't seem to have vibrancy that the Boulder bubble had. Um, may, in terms of training, it does, but in terms of a place to live, from what I've heard from some of the people living there, maybe not so much. I think Boulder's a unique city. It's got it got a lot of, uh, you know, it's it's close enough to the big city, but it's not trying to be one. Which I feel like Salt Lake, after having just visited this uh, year, you're kind of under the impression that it's a city. But man, you walk you walk like you know ten minutes from the city center, and it feels a little bit just like suburban America. Uh, everywhere. It's not, not quite what I expected, but um, my only contribution was going to be all, all these kids understand the significance of, of, of a Ford Bronco, right? Like, are they uh, like, do they, like, I don't know. I, that's the one thing I, I keep realizing is to me, I grew up with Ford Bronco being a symbol of like heinous crime and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just, I'm so surprised one that the brand came back. Secondly, that it's something that we're like trumpeting. Yeah. I'm driving away in a Ford Bronco. What a mark of success. There goes know. all chance. <laughs> there goes all possibility of Ford sponsoring this debrief. Uh, we're not. You they, said you're they never knew what getting they were getting Ford into Bronco. when they brought back a brand f- like from the dead twenty five years later. Like I guess they thought it was a selling point or something, but I don't know. Ford I haven't. I have listening. not seen a single Ford Bronco in real life, <laughs> at, like ever. Like si- like of the new ones. Pardon me. Since they brought it back, so I feel like hopefully hopefully uh hopefully the the sponsorship deal brooke had was with ford and not with the bronco because i don't think sales are very high on that based on my lived experience here in north america but anyway uh let's let's keep it moving let's not dwell on that um we're gonna go to losers and i'm giving eddie two because i'm not taking one this time so ed i'm gonna let you start with one john will take the one in the middle and eddie you can close it out so eddie what's your what's your your round one loser from okay so I'm actually going to reword this because I don't want to call the athlete the loser because although they were the loser, they're not, if that makes sense. Um, no, it doesn't, I think but whatever. The, the, yep, I, I, I will try and clarify. <laughs> okay. the, the judging in the women's finals to me was a loser. Uh, I watched that back multiple times and I don't see how they could give Brooke and Natalia the same score and then on count back give it to Natalia when Brooke made positive movement to the next hold and actually got it and then fell out of Mm -hmm. it and Natalia her body never moved it was just an arm flap and normally in a comp that's not considered a plus normally in a comp it's positive movement of your body in the direction of the next hold blah 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 and so my only thought there was maybe in the numbering of the route that the hold they were going to was numbered lower than the hold they were going from. Because if you watch women's finals, you'll actually see that Yanya climbed it different to the other woman and that she went up with her right, then out with her left, whereas all the other women went up with their left, then out with their right. And if the original sequence that they had anticipated had been up with the right, out with the left, maybe that was 41 and that was 42 sort of Mm -hmm. thing. And so by falling off going from 42 to 41, there wasn't an advancement in score. Um, But even so, I know that the hold numbering is kind of dynamic in that sense that theoretically the judges can watch how the climb is being read and that dictates the, the numbering to an extent. And yeah, I, you know, afterwards we heard there was an appeal and 
as I said, I watched it back multiple times. I watched um, Yanya, I watched Chanso, I watched Natalia and Brooke and several times watched the sequences. And to me, that was like a perfect example of a plus from Brooke. And it was pretty much a textbook example of what I would show a judge if I was showing a judge a video of what not to award a plus for Natalia. So, yeah, I feel my loser there, I was going to say my loser is Brooke because she should have been in bronze, but I don't think Brooke's the loser. I think the loser is the judging because Brooke find fantastic. It's one of those topics where my first point being, I don't think there is any reason to not be transparent with the route map aside from the fact that it is dynamic. And so the idea of broadcasting or sharing a route map when it is something that can be tweaked in the middle of the competition, if the, the route setters and the officials think is appropriate, that makes it hard to put that on the screen when you're going to be tweaking something with a fucking Sharpie on paper on a clipboard, you know, far away from the from the broadcast booth. That's really tough to share. But it was certainly very opaque from the viewer perspective of what was going on in that appeal. Um, the other point to it is... It, we always talk about the intrigue of breaking the beta and that's one of the fun things about climbing is you can put your own interpretation on it and if you get the top in bouldering it all counts right whereas in lead climbing there is this opportunity where officials and root setters can change kind of without too much uh, 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 oversight can change the outcome of a comp possibly by deciding, you know what, this is 42 and this is 41 rather than flipping it the other way around. And that almost never comes up. And obviously that's not what we're accusing anybody of, but it is one of those weak spots in terms of the integrity of competitive climbing where it's not opaque and it's kind of hard to justify why there's the ability to make those kind of subjective choices by officials. Yeah, for me, I thought potentially when they moved from the left to the right and Brooke hit this and then like came out and then fell. And I thought maybe they didn't score the plus because the idea of the plus is that you have to be moving to the next hold. Mm -hmm. And it has to be the next hold, you know, holdable hold. And right. they might have said, oh, that was the wrong sequence. But then if you watch She and So, she does exactly that. Mm -hmm. She goes from the left to the right, holds that matches and goes out yeah. so i'm like well no okay that she proves that it's climbable area. yeah she proves it's climbable yeah. because i've been at world cups where there's been appeals and the root setters have actually scooted up in the cherry picker and pulled on to say actually yeah that is possible or no it's not mm -hmm. um which probably doesn't make it to the tv but i've you know i've seen that happen live mm -hmm. um and to me yeah it at first, so when I first watched, I thought, ah, oh, Brooks being a bit, you know, a bit uncool if she's appealing her own teammate. Um, and they both got to the same place. But then when I watched, I was like, no, actually, I'd be appealing that all day long. Yeah. And, and you have to assume that, it, like, Natalia would, like, Natalia is smart enough to look at the difference between those two attempts and assuming that both of them were climbing with, like, the correct ordered beta there's there is daylight between the two of them it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a hard decision uh even for for natalia who would be at the the detriment of that appeal yeah I, I, and of course they you know as much as there's the best friends narrative and they've grown up together and stuff they're both competitors and they're both thinking of the season and the overall points for the season and where they fit in the sport so guarantee that they both wanted to be on that podium yeah um, because there is this false, I won't say false narrative, but exaggerated narrative of they're great friends, they'll do anything for you, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but in competition, you're competing. Absolutely. Yeah. That, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you're not best friends the minute the competition stops, but in competition, when you're on the wall, you're competing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I totally supported Brooke or the US team in, on behalf of Brooke protesting, and I'm disappointed it wasn't upheld. This is to say nothing of the whole flipped beaner uh, in the in the quick draw with Natalia. That her her attempt there was just so much. This their attempts were just rife with issues here. Uh, I totally forgot about that until we just kind of dived into Natalia's attempt here. And oh yeah, but even before this crux up there, there was that whole issue with the the flipped beaner. Or whatever. You it was. used to see that a lot. Haven't seen that as much lately. Like, used to see that a lot and. 
it, it really does make me question what, you know, because if you're a sponsoring company, surely you want a Beena retention system that doesn't do that because lots of people around the world are watching it. So mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of embarrassing when after a climb, half your Beena's are sticking the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. and, and back in the day, it used to be rough. I remember back in the day, there used to be, say, three or four after a climb. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's one of those, it's another great example of a technology that is not that expensive, not that hard to install and is, and, and is prevalent, not being used. So the one other being the, the bolt covers, uh, which far more recent an invention. And at this particular comp actually far more prevalent than just having a stringer on your, on your draws, right? That's not hard to, uh, hard to do. And the fact that these didn't have them, none of the draws had any kind of attachment, keeping that lower carabiner in place. Um, yeah, it's probably a little bit below par for, for where competitive climbing should be right now. Some of you take for granted until you don't have it, apparently. Yeah, I, I think there needs to be a minimum spec of equipment that make, you know, all, all drawers have to have a retention system that's proved to work. All bolts should have a, a drawer cover over it if they're on the path of the climb. I think, you know, that should be in the rules so that mm -hmm. there's consistency because... I, do I think it affected how high Natalia got? Probably not. Do I, I don't know. think I said probably not. I yeah. didn't say definitely not. And that's the thing, because it does leave margin. Mm -hmm. Particularly when the margins were so close at the finish hold, it, it yeah. caused into question how valuable even that small margin was. Yeah. And, and you know, at the time, Alana said, oh, she could call a technical and come down. It's like, yes, but then she only gets a few minutes rest and she's got to climb again anyway. Mm -hmm. So she's going to consider diminishing returns. And is it better to have 20 minutes rest and try the route again, or is it better just to keep going? Yeah. Hmm. John, what's your big loser yeah. from, the, uh, from the weekend? Let me pose to you uh, a question, both of you. I want to hear who comes to mind off, just off the top of your head, and we're just sticking to this lead, this year, this lead season. Who is the best competitor to not yet this year stand on the the podium? Oh, that's easy. We both know that. Who do you think? Yannick. Yannick. Uh, women's division. Oh, still Yannick. Uh, uh, of, of, of proven talents? I, I, oh, that's, I don't know. That's hard. I guess the one that comes to mind uh, just because of the, the championship win is Jesse Pills. Okay. Yeah, but, like but, I was... There, there See, are a couple I, I, that come to mind. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the podiums. Has Laura stood on the podium yet? Yes. She has. Okay. So, Jesse. Jesse would be a, a, a certainly a fine choice. I think you could also throw Natsuki Tani's Natsuki. name in there. And, and what's even more surprising is Natsuki hasn't stood on a podium since 2019. And, frankly, I think she's better than that. I think, I think Natsuki Tani's skill for skill is is at the near top of the women's division. And I'm a huge fan of hers. And here's, here's w what's kind of going on in my head. I, I think she has kind of defeated herself in a couple instances here at Branson. We saw, I think it was around the 18th hold, right? Where she threw in that funky, uh, like double toe hand foot match, almost like a bat hang type of type beta to move through that sequence, whereas everybody else just went through it shouldery. And it was cool beta. It was really creative. In the Discord, people were like, whoa, what the heck? Like, it, it raised eyebrows, and we were all pretty stoked because it was very much outside of the box. But, and I should know, I think we've seen that before with Natsuki. I, off the top of my head, I don't know if I can think of specific examples, but I feel like we've been in this position where we're kind of wowed by this beta that she comes up with. And yet, at the end of the day, we're kind of like, eh, but does it work better than the, the more standard beta? So that my question is, where do we draw the line with a competitor? Maybe we don't have to necessarily pick on Natsuki, but just any competitor. Where do you draw the line between saying he or she is really creative and always thinking outside the box with his or her beta and body movement and sequencing and all that, where's the line between that and, well, the beta choices that this person is making, as creative as they are, 
they just aren't smart choices. Or, or another another way to frame that is where's the line from being creative in your beta to being unwise in your beta? And I kind of just watch Natsuki and I and I I wonder these things. She's still young. She still has plenty of time to improve. I don't doubt that she will certainly improve. She'll learn. She'll get coached. But I think we've seen a couple cases where maybe her intuitive climbing ends up being too, costing her. Her intuitive beta is not the right way, quote unquote. And so I think it is a matter of coaching to some extent. Like she needs to kind of learn not to maybe go for these really wild, funky beta sequences and go for something that's a little more standard. I really want to see Natsuki stand on the podium again. And I feel like she has the talent and it's just like, she does stuff like that though, where you're just like, oh, that was really cool, but pretty costly probably. So. Yeah. Saying, saying like whether or not you're, you're creative or just, or just dumb is kind of like the, the phrase, like, you know, anybody can technically project V16, right? That's, that's not a, an accomplishment. Anybody can walk up to a V16 boulder and pretend to pull on it or, or just get injured trying a climb and the same thing with being creative on a on a world cup scene anybody can do something stupid um or something out of the box and that's not necessarily a good choice um i think you're right calling into question the intuitive nature not to say that i think it's a, a massive theme for her again from this competition i feel like it was the kind of competition that made you second guess your uh decisions it it looked very uncomfortable through all of it and so it doesn't surprise me that for at least one climber they really got you know, far outside the box, trying to cope with a very steep wall with with an unusual sequence. Um, Natsuki's interesting because she is extremely consistent for the most part. Um, in that, I think she's never missed a semifinal. She's she's a top tier athlete. She is, like I said earlier, she's one of those six women that has made every final so far this season, and she is the only one that hasn't earned a medal. Um, that's, that's, you know, kind of, uh, 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 kind of, um, splitting, splitting hairs. Uh, but it's clear that she's a strong athlete. And I think maybe a lot of it just has to do with, guess what, when you're in the final against the type of women that are there at the moment, uh, that's an extraordinarily high bar and maybe some of it's mental and maybe some of it is physical. Maybe she just doesn't have the physical skill or, or physical power and strength that some of these athletes do from their, their bouldering history, possibly. I don't know. Um, like, I mean, I think if you put, if you cut down the field to just Laura and Natsuki and Chayun, I think that becomes a really interesting competition when you take out those athletes that have been maybe proven as, as, as really high level boulderers as well. I think that makes it really close. Um, but honestly, I'm, 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 I'd be willing to accept a bet of 50-50 that Natsuki earns a medal this season. Um, I think that's possible. So I don't, I don't see it too much as a worrying pattern, but I do just think she's kind of a level below for the moment. And I think that could change when she actually scores a, another medal against these climbers. I don't know. Again, the one thing for me is I, I know I'm not a good analyst of movement. That's where I feel like I'm really weak when it comes to talking about climbing. Um, but yeah. I, I think one thing not to underestimate, and you sort of touched on it there, Tyler, was Natsuki is a resistance climber. So much more like Lara. Um, Chan So is kind of in the middle, but definitely does have that resistance style mm -hmm. where they can go forever on a consistently pumpy route and just dunk, dunk, dunk. And I think maybe in the past, what stopped Natsuki is she's been a great pumper and then fallen off where the moves are technical. Mm. And now maybe she's thinking, well, I need to be more technical, but she's being yeah. technical in the wrong places. It's like she's overthinking the climbing she has to do because she knows in the past where she's fallen off in the cruxes is because she hasn't had the technical repertoire to solve the cruxes. So now she's doing all this technical climbing, but she's actually doing it in the wrong places. She's misreading and putting cruxes too early or something like that. That that would be my take. And I, I'm going to throw in a three-word bouncer on this. Uh, where's I, Mari? 
I have I have no answers. She's on she's on Akio and Tomoa and what's his name's YouTube channel eating an egg. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> like I I that that kid is like the biggest enigma in competition climbing right now because she is so astonishingly good. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether they're doing similar to what happened with Yanya when she was growing up and they kept her sheltered, so to speak. I don't know if it's that or I don't know if it's school or if it's something else, but she sort of peeked into the World Cup scene, made everyone go, oh my goodness, and then just went back to domestic comps and has never been seen again. And, you know, Natsuki is good, but Aymari was scary at like Hachioji in 2020 or 2019. 2019. 2019, she was again one of that cohort in 2019 that was impressive but the the thing that's different is the japanese team wasn't one of the teams that kind of skipped out on all of the comps like like a place like china was where we we missed out on some of those athletes for a couple of years due to covid japan was there the entire time uh and so that's i don't believe that's one of the reasons um at least from a team level to hold her back um maybe school i i don't know um but uh definitely a loss because she was after chayun she was the other in my opinion she was kind of the second best breakout of 2019 particularly from those three or four young asian women that, that came up that year there was a statement that came out in june that uh i mori was she was choosing to focus more on school so she could enjoy climbing kind of I guess just kind of like what we're saying, like she didn't want to get burned out on the World Cup scene. She wants to do climbing as, you know, a lifelong pursuit, presumably. And so it is it does seem to be school that is the thing that she's. I'm not on. I'm not trying to push any any uh, um, any uh, uh, conspiracy theories, but isn't saying you're opting out of competitive climbing for school like a politician saying you're retiring to spend more time with your family. Like, isn't that kind of just what everybody says so people don't question it, right? I don't know. I, I always second yeah. guess that one. But <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Eddie, I want to give you one last chance. If you wanted to paste on that other uh, big loser, otherwise we'll just do honorable mentions uh, and, uh, um, and call this Well, my other, my other big loser is almost an honorable mention. We'll call it 50-50. Sounds good. Is that the guy's field has been really decimated by COVID and injury. Mm -hmm. And although I don't think it would have changed the results at the top, it probably would have given us a few different people in finals. Obviously, we were miss missing Jakob Schubert and Alberto and Adam. And, you know, there's a few others and a few like Stefano is just coming back from COVID. And it, it seems to have really messed a bunch of male athletes are Sean McCall still off injured. You know, there's a bunch of people who are still worth of the male scene who aren't there. And it's great because that gives opportunity for new blood, mm -hmm. but it's also disappointing in a way because you want to see them. I mean, the, the only positive of those guys not being there was honestly was that in Chamonix, Jakob did the watch along and that's, probably a couple of hours of the best climbing information you'll get anywhere. If you go back on YouTube and watch those watch alongs, just because it was a question and answer with Jakob Schubert basically. And sure. his in-depth discussion on things was, Oh, just so, so on point. Mm -hmm. Like put, put that man in the IFSC. <laughs> like, like don't even put him in the head of the athletes commission. Just roll Marco Scalaris off a cliff and put, put Jakob. <laughs> at the top. I'm all for that. <laughs> Jeez. All right, well, in the, as as we say in in Counter Strike, in a video game, we obviously don't mean that literally. We mean roll. Yeah, yeah, not literally. In a video not game. Literally. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, that, I, I just want to say this really ties in with my narrative uh, about uh, Taisei and uh, and Jesse is the thing that can blow up that story is just by having somebody huge, particularly like Adam Andra, just show up, right? Adam Andra shows up, that is a 50-50 that he wins it, and that is your narrative right there is, oh my God, Adam is back. He's gracing us with his presence again when after, you know, taking a couple events or a season off, the second he's there again, um, that kind of brings brings the everyman back to life and, and into the scene. So it was disappointing after seeing him on the registration list uh, that we didn't get to see him climb this week. Uh, yeah, Alberto's the one that killed me because 
I loved seeing him climb in 2019. He was somebody that I just thought was so magical. The Olympics takes a toll on everyone, of course. Uh, and then, of course, he gets injured. I wish we got to see him in a year before the Olympic hype because I, I he's one of the people I worry about most about having too much of a burden put on him. Um when it comes into the qualifying year for 2024, just because his achievement was so huge. Um, and I mean, like we say, he is he really won the Olympics off of speed climbing. He is known as a speed climber, as we all say. Um, so now that it's separated, maybe, uh, uh, maybe not quite as big a deal, but uh, I, I do worry about him. I wish we got to see him this year when, when the pressure was off a little bit. So that's something I'm concerned about. Um, John, do you have an honorable mention? Yeah, I just put Brooke Rabatu on the list as an honorable mention because I think had she ended up on the podium here, we, we went over the weirdness there with the, the 41 slash 41 plus, all that. If she had been on the podium, I think this would have been her third podium of the lead season, if I if I if I'm thinking correctly of the results. And that would have been huge. I mean, that's it's still great. She still has two, which is fantastic in its own right. But she's so close to being on there a third time. And Eddie made a good case why she should have been on there a third time. And, um, yeah, I just think Brooke's having a just an awesome season. It's on the heels of, obviously, the Olympics and her having so much celebrity, dur- celebrity during 2020 slash 2021. So she's just she's rocking and rolling right now. It's really fun to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my we kind of covered my honorable mentions uh, just by mentioning Alberto. That was going to be my my uh, uh, my honorable. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, thanks again for watching the debrief. Uh, we'll see you back in September when the World Cups kick up again. August is uh, is off. Of course, there's lots of competitions. There's the European Championship. Uh, there's the Youth World Championships. If you're into that kind of thing, uh, and I think is is Charlie commentating for the the uh, okay. for Arco. Here in Canada, in Ontario, we've got a comp at, uh, at, at Malik's gym. Uh, and then there's uh, Seco Block in Montreal, Jackalope in Montreal. So there's lots of comps going on. Uh, but we're going to take a break and wait until we get to Slovenia, which, as John alluded to earlier, is going to be very interesting uh, as we get into the last half of the lead season and the pressure builds further and further on Yanya for that unprecedented sweep. But for now, all I can do is thank John for, for joining me, as he always does. Eddie for joining us for, I don't know, fifth, sixth, seventh time and always bringing incredible insight. So thanks so much, Eddie. Uh, looking forward to his book coming out. And thanks, of course, to you to watching to the end of this, what, hour 30 episode. You guys are the true heroes. Make sure you join us in the plastic weekly discord because you belong in a place like that you can support us on patreon at the link below or at the very least like this uh, episode leave your comments and of course subscribe to the channel so from all of us thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one